Um, I, I want to say to you, I've been a Christian for um, nine, over 40 years now. And um, he is so faithful. He keeps lifting me up. Um, I've never, I've never seen the frown of Jesus over my life. There's always been that smile, and, and when I, I, I think um, he, he's, he surely must have run out of grace for me, he, he lovingly just, as it were, just leads me to back to the cross, and he, he just gives me a fresh revelation of the cross, and I, I just turn to him, and I, he smiles at me. <laughs> And it's the most wonderful smile because his smile upon my life just makes everything make sense. His smile speaks of his grace, his mercy, and it's is just immense love for me. He is such a wonderful saviour, isn't he? Um, we were counting... At, um, I'm going to confess to you, we've not slept here. We've we put our tent up here. And <laughs> last year, we snuck back without telling anybody. And we raced back in the morning. And Sue got the bacon on. And they were saying, good morning, saying good morning. And we thought, <laughs> but our church have grown in Christ so much now. They're so secure in God. that We just said, and we're going home tonight. And so we, we've been going home, lovely warm bed, warm shower. It's been so good. <laughs> it's just so good. Um, but, Sue and, and, but there's some another side to this story is that Sue and I, have, we've count, calculated, we've spent six months of our married life under canvas at Bible Weeks. A total of, right? A total of. F folks, what we are here is a byproduct of w where we've come from. You need to know that. I'm more excited by this gathering than all the rest. And I've been excited by some great gatherings. I remember Ern Baxter in the 1970s. Anybody was there for Ern Baxter? There's a few. Absolutely. Um, that was in the Dale's Bible Week, where we had a set before us a glorious picture of a restored church. And we've gone right through the various Bible Weeks. And, uh, and we're here now. There's Bible Weeks happening, all weekends happening all over the UK. And I sense um, God's given me a revelation of, of uh, it's a big word, but I do believe God's revealed more that that white line that we're crossing, it's more than a white line. I, I believe it's a river. I do believe that we are on the verge of crossing over. You know, the children of Israel were, were called by God to go and possess the land, weren't they? The promised land of Canaan. It was a good land. But for 40 years, it took 40 years for God to get his people ready. I remember Owen Baxter speaking uh, and uh, a guy called Bob Mumford. I remember it as if it was yesterday. He was saying God is going to build in kingdom content that he may produce kingdom character that we may be able to, able to handle kingdom charisma. Does anybody remember that? And I remember the, the Bible weeks we used to go to. I mean, it, for us, with young kids, it, we... we I went in fear and trepidation. Um, I, I remember one Bible week at Bilth Wells. Uh, how many kids did our teeth cut? Now, how many teeth did how many kid, um, How many teeth did our? We had our son Barney, <laughs> right? Because you, you, you go there, don't you? In those days, everybody had to be on best behaviour. You know, the model family, and of course, we weren't. Um, and our, our Barney, he cut six teeth in one night. And he yelled all night, and uh, I, I was a bit insecure in God in those days, you know. And uh, it was all, oh Lord, <laughs> I am just, but just observing here. There's, there's a godliness in the camp. There's a godliness. There's a character in the in the camp. There's peace in the camp. It's not bit, even if kids were are teething. I, I'm just, I've been observing. There's been great parenting. It's, it's wonderful. There's a peace. There's a maturity that we're living in that wasn't always there in the past. But I believe that, um, that we're on the verge of, of moving in. Not just us, but now the church in this land, I do believe, are, re are ready at long last to move in. Having God built in kingdom content, 
kingdom character. And now I believe in these days, God is really giving kingdom charisma. To, and it's a good land. We're getting reports coming back of miraculous stuff in this land that God's going to cause. This. The grapes are this big. Yeah, this big. And now, and some will say, no, we, we, they can't be. You know, some gave an evil report. But I know that you, like me, were saying, this is a good land. We've got to go in and possess this supernatural provision of God that we're en- entering into. Before we did see a, a few signs and a few wonders, didn't we? You go to the treasure, he'd sign the cheque, and now I'd wonder how we were going to get it paid for. That's, now we're seeing genuine signs and wonders taking place. We're seeing healings taking place. It's a good land. It's all God's joining it all together. I, I just, I met, I met Fred and Iris today in the bookstore. Some of you don't know Fred and Iris. Where are you, Fred and Iris? Hey, you see, they have continued the journey. They're still here. They're still running. I see Barry and Maureen at Broadstairs. I see John and Joe, heroes and heroines of the faith. You might not know them. I know them. And I thank God for them. Because it's people who have stood the test of time walking the faith. I ran a marathon once. I nearly did it once. I won't never do it again. (laughs) And this this guy, he he said, come on, I'll I'll train you. And he went off like a hare. And at 13 miles... um, he was done in, and uh, I, I just plodded along, and I finished it. Um, I finished it. I, 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 I had, I'm going to use athletic language, okay? But I, I got the bonk, right? Now, if anybody knows what the bonk is in athletic language, you're looking very scared now. <laughs> but the bonk is when you burn all your blood sugars up. Actually, we need to pray for the sign because I'm, I'm, I'm going off peace here. <laughs> Father, I just I pray for them that you'll give them grace. Yes. How do you say that in sign language? <laughs> and uh, I, 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 was, I, I was running 17 miles. I got the bong. All my blood sugars went. I th- they, some people call it hitting the wall. And I was, I was going through this park in Leicester, and I was just desperate for food, absolutely desperate for food. And I saw this Indian family feeding bread to the ducks. <laughs> and this verse came, it said, you'll, you'll never see son begging for bread. And I thought, I don't know about that, but, and I said, please give me some bread. And they were feeding me with the ducks. And that was <laughs> the race, the Leicester Marathon was running by and they were feeding me bread. And I, oh, this is wonderful. And I got through to 24 miles. And then I, had, I hit the wall again, I had to bonk again. And I saw this in John's ambulance lad, eating his sandwiches. And I, I came up, I can see, I kid you not. And I said, can I have a sandwich? And he said, have the lot. And so he gave me his sandwich and it was cheddar cheese and Commons mustard sandwich. <laughs> and, and I got there and they were packing up. They were packing up, but I got there and I finished it. In f- I did it and I've got the medal in the drawer at home. Four hours, one minute. <laughs> Not bad, is it? Three months ago, before that, I was on my back in Cornwall on holiday with a, a pulled muscles in my back. I thought, I'll run a marathon. That will get, keep me focused. You've got to have a vision, haven't you? I just love, I love mountains. I just, I will cycle in Norfolk. We used to, I used to cycle my, miles to find a hill to cycle. I mean, how crazy is that? <laughs> I do. I just love a mountain. But didn't, but didn't, didn't Caleb... Caleb said, give me a mountain. Don't give me... I just want mountains to go. And there are people here who, have, who are staying with the next generation coming through. It's, Tom, it's wonderful to see what's happening in Canterbury. We're just so thankful. We're provoked by that. But I tell you, honour the Caleb's. Honour the Caleb's because they prayed for days like this. Ollie, uh, you're going to really have another breakthrough in worship. You've got a, um, I saw yesterday, um, just like um, that perfume, that, that alabaster, um, was it Mary, wasn't it? And she came at the feet of Jesus and she broke it. 
and, and the fragrance filled the whole house. And at and, and, and the moment God has given you, 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 you've got a real gift in worship, but God has given you even more. And there's an alabaster perfume of worship. That, and you're going to know a, a wonderful breaking in God. I don't know what that means, but it's going to be wonderful. And it's going to be ointment poured forth, perfume. You, you're going you're to just move in, in a new... There's going to be a perfume that as you lead people in worship, it's going to fill the household of God. It's going to be beautiful. Focus on Jesus. Folks, we've got to focus on Jesus. We have. That's going to be... That's my talk today. We've got to focus... On him. We've got to feed on him. Got to feed on him. Got to feed on him. I'll tell you another story about cycling. You see, I, 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 I had asthma very bad as a kid. Very, I missed nearly a year schooling. That's my excuse. For many things. Um, but God healed me of asthma. Um, the person who led me to the Lord, um, I said, if God can save me, can he heal me? And he said, yes. And I said, will you pray for me that God would heal me of asthma? And he, and he laid his hands on me. You know what happened? It was like an iron corset coming off my chest. Hallelujah. Has anybody got asthma here? Will you stand? Will you stand? If you also, you've got children who have got asthma, I want you to stand. That's it. It's horrible. It's horrible for the parents looking at the children, isn't it? Shubhabha dakam. Just reach out your hands to bless. Those of you who are if you're baptised in spirit, you have power. Let's release the healing power of God. You see, Jesus on the cross, he couldn't breathe. <laughs> couldn't breathe. Gasping for breath. He knows what it's like. He's been tempted at all points like us. But by his stripes, we're healed. So Holy Spirit, I just ask you, would you release healing power now over every set of lungs? We speak to that bronchia in the name of Jesus. Be normal in his mighty name. We pray for children, Father, in the meetings, of children who are, whose parents are here. Lord, we pray even now you'll visit them in healing power. And Lord, there will be people released today from this difficulty they have of breathing. They may breathe fresh air. Right there, their puffermometer, whatever it's called, as they blow that puffer, Lord, it will go right down the scale from 150 to 300 to 400 to 500. Lord, we pray for lungs to function in the power of the name of Jesus because you are our creator. We're fearfully and wonderfully made. Amen. Amen. Okay, please be seated. Please feed it back to us. Please feed it back, because it took me a few hours before God healed me of it, but the, it came off. I got into cycling. I, 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 just, I love cycling. I don't, it might be the lycra. I just love cycling. <laughs> and uh, I remember, I, was just, I would ride from my village end a bit to Lutterworth to work, then go on to a race, and uh, come back at 10 o'clock at night and go to bed. And one, one day, I, 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 I went into a 25-mile time trial, and then got time to go back home for tea. So I strapped my racing wheels on my back. I, I rode to work, couldn't wait to the race. Uh, and I rode on the other side of Leicester, another 15 miles. And then I, I put my waist, racing wheels on, and I did a 25-mile time trial. I was flying. I just used to shave my legs. <laughs> Now, I'll tell you the truth. I want to walk into... Yeah, that's what you have to do. Yeah, I don't know why, but they do it, right? Cyclists do it. Um, I couldn't afford a razor, but I found a standing knife blade. I did. I did. It's the truth. And, uh, and uh, if you get it at the right angle, it pins all, pings all the hairs off. And uh, so then you, then you coat, coat it with olive oil, but we couldn't afford olive oil, so I put cooking grease on. I was, it was just like, I was, the, I was it, right? That was it. <laughs> Tell you what, shave your legs and go into Brian Allen sheets at night. It doesn't work. It's terrible. They, just, they start growing again, but that's another story. I, I digest. I, dig I, I digress, not digest. <laughs> now, 
I was racing, doing this race, and about 18 miles, I get the bunk. I, it, and I start to slow down. And I, oh no, I didn't, I didn't eat properly enough. And the Bentley brothers in our club, I hope that if you're a Christian and you, well, they weren't mind if they're Christians here in this world because they'll forgive me. But they were six foot two brothers in Lycra, jumping up and down on the side of the road. Do you know what they were singing at me as I wobbled by? Hawley's got the bonk. <laughs> Hawley's got the bonk. I, I felt so, oh, I, I, I need healing from this. Um, <laughs> but I, and I, I, I crept over the line and I was so starving to be fed. Um, I, I, Somebody bought me two pucker chicken pies. You remember pucker pies? Who knows pucker pies? And I was stuffing these ch- pucker pies in my mouth. This is going somewhere, trust me. If it doesn't, you'll enjoy it. But, and I was, I was stuffing pucker pies, and I, I was so tired, I couldn't swallow. And so I, was, I fell in a ditch on my way home. I did. This is true. This is true. I fell in this ditch off my bike. And my, my cheeks were so big, I looked like a rabbit on s- speed. I mean, it was, I, I, it was a benign smile on my face as the juices gradually trickled through. It's wonderful. Puck a pie with... I've got to tie this up somehow. I, 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 look, you see, you might have not had a puck a pie experience, but you may have not been servicing your car and it breaks down on you. You might have not been looking after your car engine. Somebody's looking at somebody here. And you forget to service it. Folks, we have to take care of that which gives us the power. You see, I, I, I kept hitting the wall because I didn't eat regularly. I didn't take in regularly. Albert Contador, Alberto Contador, you should have known of him. He's, he won the Tour de France last year. He's a superstar. He, he's very, very good. He's very good. Parry Nice, third stage, I think it was. He was winning. All of a sudden, he starts slowing up. People start overtaking him. Do you know what it was? He got the bonk. He hit the wall. Even superstars, if they don't feed properly, Ultimately, it will affect your performance. You won't win. And folks, we, we're in a race to win. We've got to look after ourselves. We've got to feed on Jesus. This is what this two days has been about. If you listen, you've, we've, got to, we've got to feed on him in private if we're going to minister to him in public. Right? That's not just for us here. It's for all of us. If we're going to see supernatural breakthrough and we are, it's incumbent upon us to keep in contact with the king. Keeping contact with the true source of power. Is that worth an amen? amen. We've got folks, I, I can't feed you all the time. In our church, our church know this, we have got to take responsibility to, to feed ourselves, haven't we? Because if we don't, we can't just live on charisma. Right, we've got to keep fueling that which m- gives us the power to go. Right, I can start now. I want to commend a book to you. Um, it's that's my copy called "The Cross of Christ" by John Stott. Who's got this book? Can you stick your hand up? Right, not enough. You need to get the latest. That's you see, that's well worn. I read many books. I go through many books, but there's one or two books that really go through me. This is one such book. Folks, you need, there's got 20, 19 copies left. Please, if you, if you, you need to get this. You need, as a Christian, you need to get good doctrine into you. Will you please turn to 1 Corinthians 1? Thanks, Tom. Okay. Thank you. You see, as we move in to possess this land that God has given us, God said to the 12 tribes, when you, I'm not going to give it to you all at once because of the wild animals. And sometimes you find the wild animals um, a bit closer to home than you think. Sometimes, you, sometimes even with um, 
Are you sometimes surprised by yourself? How ungodly you can be? Um, and as we pos- go in to possess all that God has got for us, there will be enemies without and enemies within which will be intent on stopping us uh, possessing all that God wants us in Jesus to have in these days as a church becomes glorious in the world. Chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace that was given you in Christ Jesus, that in every way you were enriched in him and in all speech and knowledge, all knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, I didn't realize this. Who will sustain you? (laughs) Oh, Thank you, Jesus, who will sustain you to the end. Isn't that wonderful? I've never seen that. and I've read it 10 times this week. Who will sustain you to the end? Guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful. It's Jesus who sustains us, isn't it? It says here. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son. It's great to be theologically correct. It's good. <laughs> Jesus Christ, our Lord. I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. For it has been reported to me by closed people that there is quarreling among you. My brothers, what I mean to say is... Each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized into the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one may say that you were baptized in my name. I did also, um, I, I did baptize also the household of Stephanus, but beyond that, I don't know whether I baptized anybody else. (laughs) For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. And not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ should be emptied of its power. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. You got it? The cross is the power of God to those who are being saved. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning. I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom... It pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand a sign. Be careful of demanding a sign. And Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks. Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men. And the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world. Even things that are not to bring to nothing things that are so that no human being may boast in the presence of God. Okay? When we worship, no human being to boast in the presence of God. 
And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. And I, when I came to you, brothers, I did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in God. Father, I pray you will help me right now. Amen. The Corinthian church, if you're looking in sort of a, a what car magazine equivalent, they'd be almost like a, um, Alfa Romeo. They were, they've got a lot of power, a lot of gizmos. They were m moving in, 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 in gifts of the Spirit. Um, there was lots of additional stuff, extras there. It was, um, it was, it was a, ch a church that was going places, but um, there were some noises coming from the engine. Right? Things weren't quite right in Corinth. And he had come back to Paul. He had a love for this church because he had planted it. And uh, he was, as a master builder, he wanted to make sure that it, it ran the course. The bits didn't, wheels didn't come off. And uh, we see it right back in the Old Testament. When the, when the tribes went in, later on, you see, the tribes began to have divisions, um, ungodly divisions amongst them. There was a, a bit of competitiveness, competitiveness coming in and began to wor worship to a different emphasis. But that was never God's intention. It, would, it was God's intention that the tribes, when they went in, would stay together. Hallelujah. And so we see where there's an advance taking place at Corinth. They, they were really steaming ahead. I mean, they lacked in no spiritual gift. Wonderful. But there was division taking place. There was a gathering to individuals where the emphasis was on the message, sorry, messenger and not the message. Have you got that? And that's subtle, but it can happen. Oh, I've read this new book. I'm listening to this series of ministry. There's nothing like it. And so you can begin to align yourself with it without realizing behind one ministry. And folks, we are so blessed in our world at the moment with the, the technology of, of computers and the internet and all that and CDs. We, we can tap in to any international ministry going, can't we? And we can build to it. And, and, and sometimes we can almost become tribalistic in, oh, we're getting aligning behind that ministry. I don't believe that's God's will. I think there's only one ministry we should align ourselves to. Shall we, Tony? And that's Jesus. You see, God gives gifts to the church, and he, because no one ministry can, can, can contain the whole ministry of Christ to the church, he gives different dreams, different flavors, to different insights and um, emphases to different people, but the composite view will bring us to maturity. So we have to be very wise, as Tom said, careful how you listen to see the big picture. But at Corinth, there was some going on, we're saying, well, actually, I think this Apollos guy, um, he's, he's a great Bible teacher. I'm, I'm, he's the answer. Or, or Peter, you know, a bit rough and ready, shaves his legs with a razor blade. You know, I don't know. Perhaps he didn't. Um, but Paul, you know, God, Paul can move in signs and wonders. Now, people were being attributing to these people a status that the people themselves didn't want to embrace. Got it? Paul was saying, who is Apollos? Who is Cephas? Who is Paul? You know, come on, when it's all, who are they? Aren't we just all servants? And so we have to be careful of not um, idolizing these, these great ministries that God is raising up in these times as if they were the full answer. Because they themselves would say, we are not the full answer. Only Christ is the full answer. Am I making myself clear on this? Because it's an important issue. You see, Nowhere in the New Testament were Apollos, 
Peter or Paul trying to compete with one another. just wasn't there. It's not just in lead, leaders. We, we can compete. It's not. It's, it's, it's just you've got to work that through. But, you know, can I just say the way to break through, if God wants to break you on competitiveness, ask Jesus. And what he does, he says, come on, I'll take you a little walk. And he, he takes you a little walk um, to this thing called the cross. And he says, just look at that for a bit. And y- you see him and you see yourself because we died in him, didn't we? And, uh, and it begins to be funny. I'm thinking, why am I competitive? Jesus, Jesus died for my sin. I mean, the only contribution, this is John Stott, not me, the only contribution that I make to my salvation is my sin. Even repentance is a gift. And when you really do see the cross and what he did on it, and you realize that we, we died in him. You see, you, you don't, there's not much competition in a graveyard, is there? <laughs> and so then you look back at Jesus, and he's smiling at you. And he said, what was the point of being competitive anyway? It's kind of funny. And it's broken because we need to be aware as God comes with gift and graces to anoint people, there's going to be new anointings and new giftings in the church. Don't get insecure when God gives a prophecy to somebody or develop a particular ministry, but rejoice in it. Rejoice in it because the enemy is waiting at the door. Romans 12, 4 to 5 said this, just as, just as each of us has one body with many members, And these members do not all have the same function. So in Christ, we who are many form one body. Each member belongs to all the other members. I love it how Paul and Peter honoured Paul in 1 Peter 3. You remember that? He just I mean, Paul had to rebuke Peter, didn't he? Publicly for for withdrawing from fellowshipping with the with the Gentiles. Then in 1 Peter 3, he says of Paul public in his writing. Um, what a great guy. His teachings are superb. Really honour him. Really honour him. It's just, it's, that's Jesus in peace, people. I, I, I love it in um, um, Peter's first epistle. He, he says, Peter called to be an apostle. That's how he introduced himself. Peter called to be an apostle. Second letter, a bit further on in life, he just, he introduced, second letter, he goes, Peter, a bond servant. <laughs> <laughs> What's happened there? Perhaps he met Paul. I don't know. But there was this boom, 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 boom. Um, as you get close to Jesus, what you think about yourself is less important. It really is. It just becomes funny. So it really does become funny when we take ourselves too seriously. <laughs> so what was the cure for the impending division in Corinth? He asked them a question. He says, um, was Paul crucified amongst you? Was Peter crucified? What about Apollos? Was he crucified? There's only one been crucified, and that's Jesus. He's the basis of our unity, and he's the basis of our diversity, because he gives gifts to men, and he ascended on high. Folks, we've got to keep Jesus... How we do this, this is a, we need to spirit this up. We've got to keep Jesus in our focus. We've got to live that resurrection life because we're raised with him, aren't we? And people say we've re- we're reigning with him in heavenly places. Yes, we are. That is our position as believers. But somehow Paul is saying in all of that, we've still got to keep a hold of the cross. Do you know what I mean? We can't let go of that because we're there, because God doesn't want us to let go of that because he's seated us in heavenly places, because it's still the power of God to salvation. C.J. Mahaney said this in in his excellent book, The Cross-Centered Life. There are so many things that we can get over-preoccupied with as the next new thing, all of them helpful, diet and health, healing and miracles, which is so important, okay? That's me. Godly marriage, creationalism, 
music, evangelism, the Lord's return. You can find many mature Christians who have built their life around such issues. Some even switch issues every few years. Perhaps you know a few people like that. Perhaps you're like that. Don't get me wrong, he goes on. There's, there's an important place for all these concerns. They shouldn't be neglected or ignored. New things will come along. Some will be good. Others will be even better. But according to God, only one thing will ever be the best. We've got to keep the main thing the main thing. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it's the power of God. There's a danger ahead of us as we press in to supernatural provision of God in miracles and healings that we think the power is in the miracles and the healings and the signs and the wonders and the, the gospel is just the word. Please, don't make that mistake. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation, right? The signs and wonders point, but it's the gospel that actually saves. Signs and wonders will soften hearts, but it's the gospel. It's only the fact that Jesus died for everyone's sins that, that releases the power of God. We cannot take away the power from the gospel there's a danger in it because otherwise we can do signs and wonders and, and, and just get so excited by that. But hold on, we don't talk about the cross anymore. We've got to, I love that story, Tom, that you shared last night. I know you're talking about, we, most of us, we all know who you're talking about. That, that policeman who he could have just, in his sharing of his testimony, he could have just mentioned that, I think it was God, um, but he said, but Jesus. They mention Jesus. There's no other name but Jesus through which men may be saved. First, we, we can't get embarrassed about this name. We can't. We can't get embarrassed about the cross because it's the foolishness of God which your friends and your neighbours need to discover to become authentic and real believers. That's what he was going on about. That's what Paul's saying. Come on, pull back from this jealousy. Pull back from this. This is the answer. Was Christ crucified amongst you? No. Sorry, yes. He, sorry. Was Paul, get it wrong, was Paul crucified amongst you? No. But Jesus was. He's the source of our unity, not Paul, not Peter, not Apollos. Lord, please, will you keep us from finding a source of unity in a man other than the man Jesus Christ? This, in the turn of the century, there was um, George and Stephen Jeffries. Have anybody heard of them? They, they moved in, in amazing power. Stephen Jeffries, they were, they were children of the um, Welsh revival, uh, turn of the century. And these men, they became Christians. They got filled with the Holy Spirit. On one occasion, this blind 11-year-old girl... Um, called Celia Brown, 13 years of age. She was brought to the meeting in Wales, this church meeting, and she was, she was totally blind. She hadn't got any eyes. <laughs> Came up onto the stage, and it was Stephen Jeffries prayed for her. And the power of God hit her. She went back down. She says, I could, I could start to see. And there was little beginnings of eyeball falling, forming. And within, I think, two to three days, from the research I've done, she had fully developed eyeballs. She could see. Now, that was attested by the press, right? The great thing about the Jeffries brothers, whenever there was authentic healing, they had it recorded, they had it put into magazines, so people go and visit the people and say, was this you? Yes, I'm healed. I think that's good and healthy. Another occasion, um, Stephen Jeffries was preaching in, 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 in his building. This is a, this is a sign. And the... Um, just like King Nebuchadnezzar, was it, who had this um, a, a picture of foot came on the wall uh, of, of a lamb. Before, and people were coming in to look at it. The word got out. And people would come from the village to look at the picture of this lamb, head of a lamb. And as people watched it, he was preaching. As people watched it, the lamb's head turned into the face of Jesus. Supernatural stuff. This is in our nation. And it, they said it's, it's a man of sorrows. And people responded to the gospel because they were wise enough to preach the gospel off the back of signs and wonders. They saw thousands come to Christ 
through the, their ministry of healing signs and wonders and pointing people to Jesus. But, you see, Stephen um, Jeffries, he, he moved in great miracle power, but he, he was a bad organiser. He needed his brother. He organized, he'd book, he'd double book crusades, same time. So you'd go near the Jeff, uh, Stephen Jeffries and he'd be somewhere else because his admin wasn't very clever. George was more organized. More, George was more eloquent. Stephen had great power. George was more eloquent. They began to fall out and their ministry abated because they couldn't walk together in relationship. You hearing me? Now, what was that about? Because they could move in signs and wonders, but they couldn't walk together with a cross. It says in the scriptures, out of reverence, submit yourself to one another for Jesus. Out of reverence for Christ, submit yourself to one another. Hallelujah. All right. We want, to, we want to be here for the long haul, don't we? We want to be able to walk in supernatural power, walk in fellowship with one another, and embrace the cross, seated in heavenly places, live the resurrection life. But it's unto him. It's unto him. D.A. Carson expressed it, his concern in this way. I fear that the cross, without ever being disowned, is constantly in danger of being dismissed from the central place it must enjoy by relatively peripheral insights that take on far too much weight. Whenever the, whenever the periphery is in danger of replacing the center, then we are not far removed from idolatry. Folks, we've got to keep the main thing the main thing as we now cross over. And I do believe we are crossing over. You see, it's possible to lose connection with the head. That's what Paul says in, in, in to, right into the Colossians. Having amazing things happen, he said, but don't lose connection with the head. Don't get your security in following a person. Don't get your security in supernatural um, manifestations. Get your security in Jesus and you'll be safe with supernatural manifestations. Paul never sought to validate his ministry by the supernatural encounters that he had apart from encountering Jesus. He reluctantly, when pressed, he did it. But he was very reluctant to talk about seeing things in heaven, angels he met. He validated his ministry by pointing people to Christ. <laughs> very important. <coughs> so we need to ask ourselves a question. How can we keep the main thing the main thing as we move into our supernatural vision? I believe there's four or five things God wants us to me to draw your attention to today. One is, and it's for the preachers and the teachers. We've got to keep Christ central to our preaching and teaching. Will you stand up? All those who are involved in the preaching and teaching ministry in our church, will you just stand up a moment? I want to read to you, not from the Bible, from, but from C.H. Spurgeon. I want it to go, you, some of you know it, you're smiling, but I want it to go into your spirit afresh. I believe, sermon, Spurgeon said, I believe that those sermons which are fullest of Christ are the most likely to be blessed to the conversion of the hearers. Let your sermons be full of Christ from beginning to end, crammed full of the gospel. As for myself, brethren, I cannot preach anything else but Christ and his cross. For I, for I know nothing else. And long ago, like the Apostle Paul, I determined not to know anything else save Jesus Christ and him crucified. People have often asked me, what is the secret of your success? I always answer that I have no other secret but this, the full, free, glorious gospel of living Christ, who is the incarnation of the good news. Brothers, we must preach Christ. Even if you're speaking about something else, please find a context to refer to Jesus. Please be seated. I want... but. We've got to hear this. It's so we're doing preaching training with our with half a dozen guys at our, our own church. 
And we're discovering it's so easy when we want to get into a text, we're preaching from the Old Testament, we don't even mention Jesus. We've got to mention he's there, isn't he? If we've got to keep drawing everybody back to the Lord Jesus. He went on to say this, there ought to be enough of the gospel in every sermon to save a soul. And if you're not a Christian here, you're coming in here today, you're thinking, what all this is about? It's about Jesus who died for you 2,000 years ago, who loved you so much, he wants, to, he wants to change you on the inside. And the only way he could change you was to clean you out. And he did that by his blood that was shed, for his blood cleanses you from all sin. And if you come and give him your sin, he will give you a new life. You bow the knee to him and you watch out because then you'll begin to live life in all its abundance. The second thing is this. In, in, folks, this is, a curse to, this is um, relevant to all of us. In our witness to other people. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, he said this, Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. Now, here we go. For what I received, who did he receive it from? It's a revelation, wasn't it? The encounter with Christ. For what I received, I passed on to you as a first importance. There are many things important, particularly at the moment. But the first importance is this, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Then he appeared to Peter and to the twelve. And after that, he appeared to more than five Hundred of the brothers. This is a first importance for you and I. At the same time, most of whom are still living. Check it out. Check it out. I was on the allotment. <laughs> Cycling allotment. I'm pretty strange. And um, my next door neighbour, he's very intelligent. He's a philosopher, a lovely guy, my friend. I do count him as my friend. And he was saying, Graham, um, tonight I'm going to speak to a, a load of philosophy students. They, they want to know, does God exist? And he, and he, and he quoted um, these various philosophers, and I tried to look impressed. And he said, well, I'll, I'll, I'll refer to Hegel and F is it Fitch. Um, that they think God does exist, but, but then I'll go on to the other stuff like Voltaire because I don't believe he exists. And I, I said, Derek, do you know the one proof? Jesus is risen for... Uh, oh, I'll give it away. Do you... Oh, 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 sorry. Do you know the one proof of the existence of God? And he looked at me. I mean, he's a, he's a triple A at Oxford, I think. And he said, no, what's that? I said, hey, don't you know it? He said, no. Are you sure you don't know No, no, I don't know it. He says, I said, because Jesus has risen from the dead. Do you know what he said to me? He said, oh, I've got to go. See you. That's the answer, isn't it? That's the one proof. That's the one proof. Jesus has risen from the dead, that God raised Jesus from the dead. It was a Holy Spirit mo own moment. It was wonderful. And before I could have bottled out, but I thought, I'm going to talk about Jesus more than ever now. I'm just going to do it. Blow it. I'm going to do it. And it's great because God, you know, privately worshipping Jesus. It's lovely worshipping Jesus, isn't it? I've discovered you two worshiping Jesus. I, I'm, I, sometimes I try and get my guitar out. Sue saw me this week. She said, well, you got the guitar out. I thought, I, I, I can't play. The, I try and sing and worship. I just can't do it. So what I do, I Google, I Google a song. I think, oh, yeah, it's a great hit. It's a great hit. So I Google it, and, and it comes out on YouTube. I've got my laptop there, and I'm worshiping um, Jesus Keep Me Near the Cross. Do you remember that good old one? Oh, I love that. I, 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 it wrecks me. So 15 times later, I'm 15, I've pressed the re repeat button 15 times later. I've got no tears left. Honestly, I can't, and it's after, then the Spirit of God comes on me and I start laughing. And I'm laughing so much because the cross is so good. And Jesus is just like poured his joy into my life. And so I press it again. I, I, I even said to him, excuse me, Lord, I just want to press it one more time so I can worship a bit more before we talk. It's like, God, it's wonderful. Jesus, keep me near the cross. Oh, it's a wonderful hymn. But I want to talk more about Jesus. And when we talk more about Jesus, things happen. I've discovered people who talk more about Jesus to other people 
see more people become Christians. There's an evangelist friend of mine, John Wright, at Norwich. Um, John Wright, he, he got wrongly imprisoned for something he didn't do in Norwich prison. Very, very intelligent businessman. He led 50 people to the Lord. That's what you do, isn't it, when you're in prison? And uh, he moves in signs and wonders. He does. I mean, he asked me if I'd like to go shooting at his place to get some rabbits. I got an I'm it's an air rifle, um, cyclist, an allotment here. And he took me a very big house, um, very big house. And, um, so it was me going after shooting his rabbits so he was getting his vegetable plot. And John, with his deer stalker hat type, his jacket, and he's walking behind me, right? So and I see this rabbit in his vegetable pot, and I aim at a fire, and it... <laughs> and he said, did you get it, old boy? And uh, that's how he talks. Sorry, John, if you listen to this bit, that's how you talk. And uh, I said, I think I did, John. I think I did. And I walk up there. Oh, I forgot to tell you. He was so pleased because he said, there's a little, little owl nesting in that tree up there. I should have told you that first because it's a... Anyway, you can see where this is going. So I go over to this rabbit and it's the first time I've been allowed to shoot in his country mansion. And it's not a rabbit. It's a little owl. Or I top this little owl. It's not funny. It's not... It, there, I think... Oh, well, it is funny now because there's good news coming. And now I was faced. Do I lie? To say, oh, I put him back. Yes, good, good shot, John. Uh, thank you very much. Or do I say, John, I've just killed your little owl. And I, I, I thought, I've got to walk in the light here. So I said, John, I've just killed your little owl. Do you know what he did? He, he picked it up and he said, in the name of Jesus, be healed. And the little owl went and came back to life. He did. I tell you, it did. It did. It did. It did. He just moves in the supernatural so naturally. He went, he took me out to lunch, and we're sitting there, I'm thinking, he's worth a bob or two, we'll have a good meal. And uh, you are, John, you are, but you're... you're so. And he, the waitress comes, and um, <coughs> he says to her, this is Graham. He's going to tell you how much he loves Jesus and how Jesus saved him. <laughs> Try it the next time you take Tom and Josie out for a meal. They deserve it. He went up to this, um, he, he flies all over the world. He went up to this British Airway stewardess and um, he, he starts singing a love song to her. He does. And it's a love song about how much God loves her. She starts crying. I mean, he just, he's just outrageous out there for Jesus. If you're a gas man visiting John's house, he's on his knees. The gas man's on his knees. And he says, do you know Jesus? <laughs> he leads the gas man to the Lord. That's John, John Wright. Check it out. Check it out. Folks, I want to be like that. I'm getting too old not to. I want to, let's, be, let's live a bit dangerously. Because if we talk about Jesus, it points to the cross. It's, it, there's no other name by which he can, we can be saved. Is that enough for you? Is that is Jesus enough for you? <laughs> Thirdly, in our works, um, we are called. Jesus said, because I go to the Father, you will do greater works than I will. You will. And we're, bit, we're on the edge of this now. But in our works, we need to refer to Christ. I love that um, story in um, is it Acts chapter 2, the, the, the beggar at the gate, beautiful. Peter and John, is it Peter and John or Peter and Peter and John, walking along. Who was it? Peter, Peter and John, walking along. And that blind beggar, he says, um, give me something. And he says, hey, silver and gold have I none, but such I have, give I thee. And the name of Jesus Christ, something like that, isn't it? Authorised version. And uh, he prays for him. <laughs> And he gets up, and he gets healed. And people are watching it, and they're saying, what's all this about? What do they do? They point straight back to Jesus. This happens because you crucified Jesus. Straight back to the cross. Is that enough for you? I think that's enough for me. Folks, be, re be prepared. When God starts moving through you in healing signs and wonders, please refer back to Jesus. Please refer. Not even to your church or come along on a Sunday. No. Because Jesus died and rose again, this is what this, is what this power is all about. Folks, and we've, got, we've got to keep feeding ourselves on this if we're going to do the journey, if we're going to win the marathon. We, 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 it's, it's the power of God. We've got to keep feeding ourselves on the, on the glories of the cross, communing with Jesus. It, oh, it's the way. It is the way. And fourthly, is it, yeah, fourthly, we need to be able to remember and recall what God has done. It's important that we keep learning to using our capacity to remember. 
in the Old Testament, um, he, God would speak to the, uh, he, he, he would tell uh, those ancient forebears to, to build monuments to remember what God had done. On the night Jesus died, before he died, um, Jesus did something very significant. He introduced something by which he wanted us to remember him by. And that's breaking bread, the Lord's Supper, when we take the bread and the wine. What's this got to do with us? It's got everything to do because that's Jesus' chosen way for you and I in our churches to keep remembering him, to keep coming back, to keep feeding. Right? He could have chosen a myriad of different ways by which he wanted us to remember him, but it is the fact that he died on the cross for us. I just think he's trying to say something in that, isn't he? Folks, I know a number of churches in this area are revisiting how we do breaking of bread um, and to refresh teaching on it. Please, that is important. That is important for that, right? That is important for that. So, folks, let, let, let us be aware when we break bread, we are not just doing something else. We are getting back. We're touching our core base of what it's all about. We're energizing. We're feeding. We're charging our batteries. Please, I hope you're breaking bread readily in your church, in, in house to house. That's what Jesus wants for you. This is how you remember him. And fifthly, um, in our worship, um, I'm getting known as, a, I have a bit of a bugbear about this. I, have, I, just like to, I just like to be in a worship meeting where Jesus is mentioned once. You know what I mean? I, just, I don't know why, it might just be me, but I just think, We've, we've, we've had a preach for 45 minutes or an hour, however long. And we've worshipped for 45 minutes and Jesus hasn't been mentioned once. I just think it might become a bit unsafe later on. It's God will pull out more and more power because I want, I, want, I want it all to come back to him. It's in him, isn't it? And I want to say this weekend for me, the worship, as I'm a bit... I just love the what what's it's been great, isn't it? It's been Christ-centered, powerful, glory, fill of glory. I, my handkerchief is sopping wet at times with tears. I say, oh Jesus, this, I think that's a safe place to be. And worship leaders, please, will you keep honoring the Lord by choosing God-glorifying songs that that Jesus gets a look in? Yeah, you see, we love the Spirit, but the Spirit wants to glorify Jesus. He's quite happy. He wants to glorify Jesus. God, three in one. And Father, Jesus wants to glorify the Father. It's holy trinity. It's wonderful. Let's get this doctrine in us. But the Father wants to point to the Son, worship him. We talk a lot, and rightly so, about heaven invading earth. Right? That's how we're breaking through. Because we're to give us his day, our daily bread, your kingdom come, uh, 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 your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's what Jesus asked you to pray. So we as we, um, so helpfully with Bill Johnson when he's talking about bringing heaven down on earth. I wonder what worship in heaven is like. If we could look into the portal of heaven, what would we see? What does God consider important? The Holy Spirit has been writing this over the weekend, my talk. We've been one reference after another in Revelation. Paul, um, John was taken in the Spirit on the Lord's day. He said, then I saw, he was taken into heaven. He said, then I saw a lamb. Looked as if it had been slain. Standing in the center of the throne. Not even to one side. It had been standing in the center of the throne. Encircled by four living creatures and elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. And he came and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which were the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll to open its seals because you were slain. <laughs> you were slain with your blood. You purchased men for God from every tribe and language, every people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom of priests to serve our God that will reign on earth forever. Then I looked and heard the sound of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands, 
Tens of thousands and times 10,000. What's that in maths? That's a lot of angels, isn't it? It's a lot of thousands, isn't it? It's, they encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders, and in a loud voice, they sang, Worthy is the Lamb. <laughs> He's worth it, isn't he? He's worth it. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, I just get so excited about the lamb. You see, when we're praying heaven down, when heaven comes down, I don't think it's going to have another focus other than that, do you? Have you got it now? So if we want great worship, let's focus on the Lamb. There'll be, other, there'll be other songs. We're not saying every song, but please, somewhere in the song list, if the musicians don't do it, somebody start one off, will you? Um, you know, we've got to keep that sense of songs coming from the congregation. I was, I was at a great conference um, uh, on healing signs. One was Bill Johnson's conference at Tunbridge Wells and uh, extended time of worship. And just, you know, you go, you go in and out, don't you? And it got a bit, it, it sort of dialed down a bit. Um, my wife doesn't like me wearing, using that phrase. She doesn't understand it, but men do. We just dialed down a bit. And um, many people just sat down. And one man, he started singing, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross from the congregation. Very courageous to do that, I tell you. 850 people. And this man. When I survey the wondrous cross. And one or two thinking, is this all right? Can we do this? Because it's not the band doing it. And one or two had the courage to, this might be of God. And they had the courage to sing. And because others were singing, others then joined in. Do you remember that, those of you there? And something happened. In the spirit, it seemed that heaven came down. Then there was a, everybody, everybody was just launched in to this hymn. The band, I, I don't know, the band were great. I think they must just put the instruments down. It was just, um, I always get this word wrong, acapello, is it acapella? I want to say acapulco, but not church, no, that, but <laughs> they just sing. And we were just, it was just, a God came in our worship. What people don't know, that that man, Andrew Hopley, had seen his brother buried the week before of terminal cancer. That brother was the man Dave Holden describes the funeral of yesterday. I knew Daniel. I played squash with him. I hated it because he fought for every point. When he had cancer, um, the family would gather every week, every Sunday afternoon from across East Anglia to pray and fast. Even Daniel's um, parents-in-laws were fasting for, for him. They weren't even Christians. God, will you, will you break it? Would you heal Daniel? Why? And at one, they couldn't do any more after all the medication. And it, was, it seemed that prayer alone was keeping Daniel on earth. And we had occasion to go to Norwich the other week and I had the privilege of meeting um, this man's wife who sang out in that song, um, lovely Christian. And she said, Graham, when, when Daniel died, we, just before he died, we were gathered round his bed. He could hardly sing. The cancer had gone to his, his head and his throat. He was covered in sores. And he said, Sally said, Graham, you know what he said? I just love Jesus so much. And he, he, she said, he, he asked, can we sing a hymn? I think it was that, if I'm right, I think it was that hymn that Andy sang when I survey. And apparently he rallied for one verse. And he was able to gain his strength and sing one verse for the family. And he just said, I love God so much. I love Jesus so much. And Jesus took him off the court of life to receive the victor's crown. Do 
we are called by God because there are many people like that who have got no hope, unlike Daniel, who are desperately looking for a meaning to life. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the only hope for humanity. We worship him. We draw on his spirit's presence. We're going to understand afresh the cross in order that we may reach the lost. Folks, as we conclude this conference, you must understand what you've encountered. We are not plain church. People are dying out there. And the only answer is the answer that you have, which is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ because it is a power of God to salvation. You've got to unleash it. Brothers and sisters, you have got to unleash it. Talk much about him in public. Worship him much in private. And God will do far more abundantly through this power that's at work within us than we can think or imagine. Will that be enough? <laughs> That would be enough.